Hi everyone, Adrian here, Sydney Mortgage Broker. On um, this uh, video we're going to be going through the old debate of principal and interest or interest only for investors. And to give you a little bit of context, the appointment that I had with this particular investor, and I won't mention names, focuses on how they manage risk. Now some of the comments that were said in the actual um, in the actual video call that we did was that they felt more comfortable with principal and interest, which is completely fine and and uh, and I understand why they say that. Also uh, suggested that one that they could get a slightly better interest rate, which again is uh, true. Most of the time you're getting about 0.1 or 0.2 percent off if you if you're going principal and interest compared to interest only. And from their point of view, they always wanted to know that they were paying down their, their properties that they were purchasing. All right, so that was the starting basis for the, um, the talk that we had. So let's go through the post and then I'll discuss um, some of the things that were brought up. So the old P&I and IO debate was something that came up when a client wanted to discuss risk. The client picked P&I but didn't realize it changed their goals and how quickly they wanted to retire. I'll explain. Goal prior to uh, speaking to us was age 50. Goal after speaking to us, which was the exact same goal, they realized that they could do it in the next two to three years, which would have been eight to ten years earlier than they expected. Now, if they went down the P&I path and paid down the debt, even if they had high yields of 8 plus percent with granny flats on the back, gross yield approach, you aren't clearing that debt for 8 to 12 years unless you're putting a, a very large portion of your own pay in on top of the rental. If you do uh, I.O., roll it uh, into more property deposits. All right, so there's a big difference. You've got uh, a portion of your, um, probably the payments 30 to 40% higher, and a larger portion of that is principal, and it's paying down your property. But a lot of people have IO, they keep the payment as low as possible, they build up the amount in their offset account, and then they use that to fund more property deposits, so less money is coming out of their own pocket, or if the same amount is coming out of their own pocket, they can fund more deposits and get more property quicker. All right, so let's go on to the rest. So build your base of house and granny flats, which you never sell. So yeah, so we're gonna go IO, roll it into more property deposits. Then we're gonna build a base of house and granny flats, which you will never sell. After building the base level of properties, you won't sell if you have a, a choice. At the end, you've got a couple of options. You can have five to 10 that you have the intention of selling three, five or seven years down the track. So some people, uh, what they do is they build up their base level and then they'll go into say Northeast Queensland and buy five to 10 up there, hold them for three, five or seven years and then sell that portion down to clear a good chunk of debt using the equity growth approach. Okay, and they've already built their cash flow on their base properties and they're gonna keep those long term. So that's one way to clear a good portion of debt when you go into your, your retirement phase and a, a quicker way of paying off debt than just going principal and interest. Um, you can use those properties to clear a good portion of the debt on the base properties, then retire on the base properties. So that's one strategy. Or um, put grannies on the five to 10 base level and then do another five to 10, put granny flats on the back of that and create so much extra cash flow you can live off the difference. And then at the three to four year mark instead of the 10 to 15 year mark, you're in a position where you can actually retire early or at least it gives you the choice on do you wanna continue your current job. So that's another way that you can look at it. Or another way is continue buying to a point that you're happy and have the income replacement, then start flipping duplexes per year for income and debt pay down. Some do or do, do not like the development risk, it's up to you. The bigger your asset base is, the more protected you are as a developer. 
So that's another strategy that you can use for paying down portions of debt without going principal and interest. And you're taking away a lot of the risk associated for the uh, easier types of developments because you have a large built of base um, level properties that you're never going to sell. And everyone knows the developer out there, Harry Trigiboff, and he's the, the reason why he's never defaulted and he's never had an issue is currently he holds over 7,000 properties under Meriton and no developer or bank or economic condition or government can force him to sell at a time that he does not want to sell. So if you've got the ability of holding period, then you will never be in a position where you're, you're left holding the bag. Okay, and when you're going into the development space, you want a really good solid base of property to protect you in all kinds of economic environments. All right, so that's, that's another approach. Or some people just hold the debt for life. So there's the Chris Gray, your empire approach. Okay, the inflated dollar keeps on going um, for the next 30 to 50 years. Inflation keeps on hitting, making it easier to pay off the debt. So if you hold the same level of debt, but the dollar keeps on inflating so much so that in 50 years time, the rents have gone up, the economic growth has gone up on the property to a point that that 30 year mortgage can get paid off in one to three years. That's what some people do. Other people hold the debt for life. I mean, it, it's another option for you. So, um, so let's read the rest. So why worry about it? Constantly rolling interest only periods of five years is part of this strategy which the equity and the rents go up while you're rolling the five year IO periods. It's great for your tax benefits as well and always speak with an accountant. So um, and if you wanted added protection for equity growth and the cash flow buffer, um, you can potentially also shop around for a three or a four year fix. Lock that in for a period so you know you're protected, which is something I'm shooting for at the middle to the end of next year. Okay, so this is a concept of building up your base level property, getting up to the size that you want and realizing that now you've got something to lose. So potentially taking um, not the best approach long term, but knowing that you've got a larger portfolio to protect, you might want to lock that portfolio in on a four year fix, knowing that your cash flow positive two, three or four hundred grand. And if you do that, you're pretty much locking in those equity gains as well. So if, you, if I've uh, got a property portfolio of, say, 15 million and uh, I shop around middle to end of next year, that could be going up on average five percent a year. So 15 million. So you're looking at 750 grand a year. Uh, 1.5 and uh, 3 mil total that you've locked in in equity gains over the over the four year period that you've got the fix, knowing that um, you know the payment will never change during that period. So you're essentially shoring up yourself to get a lot bigger. The rents go up during that time, and look, you may get a specky period of 10% growth in some of those years, but but the reality is you built up the portfolio. So now you want to get up to the stage where you're indestructible. So some people use that to manage their risk. They lock in a three or four year fix once they've built the portfolio mm -hmm. and then they retire knowing that they're cash flow positive and that they're going to get those gains over the next couple of years as well and they're protected on their interest rate. All right. So other ways to manage risk in your head could be some of the following items. The larger your portfolio gets, the more cash you sit on the sidelines for buffers. So that's another way. So right now, I might be only sitting minimum 150 to 200 grand in my account. But over the next kind of two years with how big my portfolio is going to get, hopefully over 50 doors, I may want to up that to, you know, three to 400 grand as a safety measure against anything bad happening. So the concept of increasing the cash buffer. Another way is fixed uh, rates at strategic times. So we've already talked about that. So you once you get to a stage that you built your asset base, now you're in protection mode. You wanna hold it for the lo longest amount of time possible, uh, get that equity growth as much as possible and safeguard yourself to hold it as long as possible. So that's one, another way to manage risk. 
Okay, third one, at the end, splitting loans between two banks. So one bank doesn't control all your risk if they change policies for interest only loans, if that's part of your strategy. So um, there was a bank ANZ, um, it would have been about four to five years ago. They got tapped on the shoulder uh, by APRA saying that they were doing way too many interest only loans. And um, essentially they got told overnight, you can't renew um, as many loans and you've got to get down to this kind of level on interest only on your book. And uh, overnight they had over 500,000 customers that they tapped on the shoulder and said your payment's going to go up 30 plus percent because we're rolling you under principal and interest and you've got less than six months to move out of ANZ or get ready for the P&I payment because we're not rolling you back under interest only. All right, so that was something that really big and did shake up the industry a lot. So a lot of the time, if you get big, I'll give you an example. You might hold a lot of loans in Macquarie at the moment, but once you get really big, you might hold, you might get an offer from say Westpac Private, and to hold half of your assets there, half in Macquarie, so one bank doesn't fully control you. All right, so that's another kind of concept. Once you built it, you want to um, spread it between say two to three banks and that, that gives you a, a little extra protection, especially if you're wanting to roll interest only periods. All right, so overall, it's a good um, good little video that we're doing to discuss you know, some of these concepts and it really comes down to what your goals are. A lot of people think principal and interest will get them to where they need to be, but at the end of the day, if all of that cash is being sucked into paying off the properties, it's not being used to fund um, future deposits. And even if it is being used to pay off the properties, a lot of the time it's much slower than how you can utilize interest only. So. You know, some people listen to this um, and including the client that I discussed it with and some people take it as a grain of salt. Other people just won't change their ways. But at the end of the day, as long as you've discussed everything and, and decided that you've given good information to a customer to discover, to discover other kind of strategies on how they can manage their risk, okay, it's, it's at the end of the day, this kind of high level stuff is what a lot of the more sophisticated investors are doing and that's that's why they're able to achieve a lot more than other clients that may just be rolling these kind of principal and interest approaches. So hope that this uh, video gives investors a lot of value. Hit that like button, hit the comment, uh, leave me a comment, see if you if you've uh, if you like the video or if you've got suggestions on other videos, I'd, I'd love to um, to get some of that. And hit that subscribe button, hit the bell icon, and uh, we'll see you on the next video. Have a great day. Bye.